This is podcast 16. When will Zion be established? Welcome to podcast number 16. When will Zion be established? Now that has been the question because we've been talking about Zion for a long time and we have a number of definitions of Zion that we find in the scriptures, the pure in heart in the book of Moses. That was Enoch's Zion. And Isaiah has his own definitions of Zion. It consists of those who repent and those who return. Repent spiritually and those who return in an exodus to Zion, the place Zion, in the end time. And in contrast to Zion, we have Babylon in the book of Isaiah. Is also a people and a place, as Zion is. People are those who don't repent, the wicked and the sinners of the world who remain so after being warned, and then the place is the world at large on the eve of its destruction in the end time. We have two opposite entities, and we're talking about Zion today. The pure in heart, or those who repent, and those who eventually return to promised lands in the millennial age, or prior to the millennial age. All right, so we're going to start with the scripture from 1 Nephi 13, verses 35 to 37 which talks about the time that the prophet Joseph Smith would restore the gospel. And it's quoting also in referencing Isaiah 52, 7, which is more properly fulfilled in the end time. But listen to this. This is the time of the restoration. It says, Behold, these things, these things being the Book of Mormon, shall be hid up to come forth unto the Gentiles. And as we've learned, that is us the Ephraimite lineages that have come through the Gentiles, by the gift and power of the Lamb, and that would be the Urim and Thummim, through which the prophet Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. But we must not forget that this can also have a dual fulfillment at the time when the seal portion of the Book of Mormon comes forth. And so we'll have another repeat scenario of this with someone else doing the, the translation and that likely would be the Lord's end-time servant, but it doesn't actually say that anywhere. It only says in 3 Nephi 21 that the Lord's servant will bring forth the words of Christ, referencing the large plates of Nephi, on which the words of Christ were recorded, all that he spoke in the end of the world from the very beginning, from its foundation. It says, And in them shall be written my gospel, saith the Lamb, and my rock and my salvation. I don't know why that is there. Actually, my rock and my salvation. Whose rock and whose salvation? Well, all of us, I guess. Because Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is the rock of our salvation. He also personifies our salvation, as we discussed previously. And blessed are they, this is the main sentence in this verse, blessed are they who shall seek to bring forth my Zion at that day. That is, at the time the Book of Mormon comes forth. There are those who seek to bring forth his Zion. And then the question arises, of course, well, do they succeed in bringing forth Zion? And as we've seen to date, the answer is no. They have not yet succeeded. We have not yet succeeded in establishing Zion. We talk about stakes of Zion and so forth. But really, if Zion had been built already and established, the Lord would have come to that Zion. But it's still waiting to happen. And we'll see how that develops in a moment as we discuss other scriptures about this. For they shall have the gift and power of the Holy Ghost. Right. And that is how the Lord speaks to the Gentiles, as we know, is through the power of the Holy Ghost. Whereas to the house of Israel, he manifests himself directly, as he makes clear in the Book of Mormon. The Gentiles would be blessed to have the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and to guide them. And if they endure to the end, they shall be lifted up at the last day and shall be saved in the everlasting kingdom of the Lamb. All right? Fair enough. And then he starts quoting Isaiah. Isaiah 52, 7. Isaiah 52 is really kind of a restoration chapter in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah kind of reaches a crescendo in its prophecies from about chapter 47 on, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 
these are the ones that are quoted very often in the Book of Mormon. We have 48, 49 by Nephi, 50, 51 also by Jacob, and 52 here by Jesus, a whole bunch. And then 53, of course, is the chapter in which the Lamb of God suffers, the servant chapter, although he himself is never called a servant. All right, let's move on. Whoso shall publish peace, ye tidings of great joy, how beautiful upon the mountains shall they be. This is finishing up that quote from 1 Nephi 13, verses 35 through 37. And that is a quote from Isaiah, verse 7, as I mentioned. There are those who published peace in the time of the prophet Joseph Smith and soon thereafter. Ye tidings of great joy from the Book of Mormon. How beautiful upon the mountains shall they be. And, of course, mountains being a metaphor for nations in the book of Isaiah, you might translate this also, how beautiful among the nations shall they be. That is, publishing peace, declaring the restoration of the gospel through the prophet Joseph Smith at the time of the restoration of the gospel. All right, moving on. We go to 3 Nephi 16 through 19, where Jesus also quotes, from Isaiah 52, verses 8 and 9, the next two verses. Zion is established in fulfillment of the words of Isaiah. So eventually Zion is established, but it's in fulfillment of the words of Isaiah where they actually do establish Zion, and it's all in the end time that it, that it happens. Thus hath the Father commanded me that I should give unto this people this land. He's speaking to the Nephites. So the Americas are really their inheritance, their land of inheritance, that I should give unto this people this land for their inheritance, and then the words of the prophet Isaiah shall be fulfilled. Now that is the time that they're fulfilled. That is the main fulfillment. It was kind of a precursor in the time of Joseph Smith, but it never fully materialized, but this time around it's going to materialize. That is, when the house of Israel the Nephites, or the Lamanites of today, or a mixture of Nephites and Lamanites, and also, by association, the Jews and the Lost Ten Tribes, when they are established in their lands of promise, then the words of Isaiah are fulfilled, which say, quote from Isaiah, Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, the happy day, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion bring again or restore or establish Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. These watchmen, as we mentioned this before, and you'll notice in the Book of Mormon that these scriptures keep repeating themselves. Some of them we have quoted already in different kinds of contexts. Here we're talking about the establishment of Zion in this podcast. But they also keep repeating the same kinds of things whenever they prophesy. These things are very important to Nephite prophets, as we mentioned. They have a great care for what's going to happen to their end time posterity. So these watchmen, who replace other watchmen, as we mentioned, watchmen that don't watch, basically, and these end time watchmen, that is, in the time immediately preceding the coming of the Lord, these watchmen will see eye to eye, all have the same cosmic vision, the vision of the end from the beginning, as all translated beings do. And they're happy and they're going to lift up their voices because up to, up to them, their voices have not been lifted up or they've not been vocal about things. But when they receive this empowerment of God, then they start singing aloud the good news as we also see in these next quotations that I'm going to read to you. So there comes a time then, in that day and age, that is, in the end time, when Zion is actually established, and it's established among the house of Israel, not among us Gentiles or Ephraimites who have come through the Gentile lineages. I'm quoting from 3 Nephi 21, verse 1. Jesus speaking, I'll give unto you a sign that you may know the time when these things shall be about to take place, that I shall gather in from their long dispersion my people, O house of Israel, and shall establish again among them my Zion. 
But there we have it. The Lord is going to establish among the house of Israel his Zion. And it's all a preparation for the coming of the Lord. And when Zion is established, as with Enoch's Zion, then the Lord can come to the Zion and live with his people in Zion. And of course, we know that that part of the second coming of the Lord to the old and new Jerusalems. All right, so we're going to have a look at now in 3 Nephi 20, where Jesus speaks about Jews specifically. And of course, in the same breath, he usually talks about the whole house of Israel. And he again, he quotes from Isaiah 52, verses 8 through 10 this time. The time cometh when the fullness of my gospel shall be preached unto them, that is, to the Jews. But we know from previous podcasts and scriptures that we've read that the fullness of the gospel is not taken to the Jews until after the Gentiles as a whole reject it, right? And then it turns back to the Jews, the same as what happened when the Jews rejected Christ and the gospel turned to the Gentiles. Now that situation reverses itself. So the time cometh when the fullness of my gospel shall be preached unto them is the time when the Gentiles as a whole reject it. But guess who takes it to the house of Israel? Who takes it to the Jews? Those Gentiles who repent, namely the kings and queens of the Gentiles whom we've discussed thus far, and we'll discuss them again here. And they shall believe in me, the Jews, that I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and shall pray unto the Father in my name. This is a big step for the Jews who for centuries been persecuted by Gentiles and believed that that was done in Jesus' name. And they believe the most outlandish things, for example, that, that the New Testament is about Santa Claus and about the Pope and this, <laughs> that and the other thing. They totally missed the picture because they've been deceived by the, the craftiness of men to believe in false traditions. The rabbis have convinced nearly all the Jews that those whose eyes are opening today and beginning to believe in Jesus, that Jesus was an apostate who led Israel astray and that we should not even mention his name. In fact, when they mention his name, they use an acronym that means, may his name be blotted out. So, this is the huge step for the Jews to come to believe in Jesus. That I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God, pray unto the Father in my name. Of course, once that happens, wait and see, the Lord begins pouring on his Spirit upon them and giving them manifestations of himself. And then he starts quoting Isaiah, which we quoted again a a moment ago, from 3 Nephi 16, this being from 3 Nephi 20. Then shall their watchmen lift up their voice, and with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. He's repeating it again, like I said. And then will the Father gather them together again and give unto them Jerusalem for the land of their inheritance. All right, so we see a three-step program here. First of all, they believe in him. Secondly, then he gathers them together which is from the four directions of the earth. And then they receive lands of inheritance, which is the land of Jerusalem as a permanent inheritance. When it says inheritance, it's a millennial inheritance. There's no buying and selling of land in that time. It's a permanent inheritance that each one receives. Like as when Joshua distributed the promised land anciently, when they came out of Egypt into the promised land, he distributed to all the tribes and the tribes distributed to their clans, to their families, and so on. So everybody had a permanent inheritance. At least that was meant to be permanent. Then shall they break into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Father hath comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. So that time, Jerusalem, much of it will be destroyed, and they will rebuild. They will rebuild their temple. That will uh, be a place where the Lord can come and speak to his people, and also... He will redeem the city so that it will no more be come into siege and so forth, as it will and as it has been in the past, and will again. The Father has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. Now, we discussed the holy arm before, and of course, that is the thing that precipitates this entire end-time scenario, when the Lord's arm is revealed or made bare and empowered of God. Then this whole work of restoration of the house of Israel is set in motion in earnest. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of the Father. Of course, when you read the book of Isaiah and you, you see the word salvation, you know that it signifies the Lord Jehovah himself who personifies salvation. We've seen that 
He's called the rock of our salvation. He's also just called our salvation. In fact, the name Jesus, as I mentioned, is the very same noun, salvation. And the Father and I are one. And so we're waiting for an amazing series of events to happen. And who knows, but they will happen soon. It seems to most of us, I think, that we're not going to return to the way things were in our day now, that the first domino of this end time series of events has fallen, and that we can expect all these events now to happen in quick succession very shortly. Then we go to 3 Nephi 20, continuing this passage that Jesus is giving us, again quoting from Isaiah 52, but this time from verses 1 through 3 and 6 through 7. Zion is established when she receives good tidings. Then shall be brought to pass that which is written, again written by Isaiah, that is, says Jesus, Awake, awake again, and put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Now, this is called the day of power, when the Lord empowers his people. And as we saw in chapter 51, first his end-time servant awakes and arises, the arm of the Lord is empowered, and then soon on the heels of that, as this work is set in motion, then his people Zion awake and arise. And of course, it's speaking about the holy city, not the current so-called holy city in Jerusalem, but the new Jerusalem and the old Jerusalem in its sanctified state, when it truly is holy and sanctified, and the wicked have been thrown out of it, or choose to leave, let's put it that way. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. No more telestial people will be there. Or worse, sons of perdition, which also hang out sometimes. Shake thyself from the dust, arise, sit down, O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands around thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion, for thus says the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Right, so how are they redeemed? Through the atonement of Jesus Christ. And because of the atonement of Jesus Christ, it is possible that we can all be forgiven of our transgressions, but also that this great reversal of circumstances can happen from curse to blessing to God's covenant people, and that this restoration can then take place. It's all based on the atonement of Christ. So what happens to individuals individually can also happen to God's people collectively, and eventually can happen to the earth as a whole as well. All those three follow the same pattern in the book of Isaiah, in rising from a lower state to a higher and being reborn to a higher spiritual level in each instance. It is from a captive state, from a lost and fallen spiritual state, but also from a fallen physical state that the Lord is going to do this for his people. Then continuing in 3 Nephi 20, verses 36 through 40, Zion is established when she receives good tidings. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that my people shall know my name. Now there's something about a name. To know his name really means to know him personally. Yea, in that day, that's the day of judgment that's coming upon the earth, they shall know that I am he that doth speak. It's another way of saying they shall know me or know him. And then shall they say, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings unto them, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings unto them of good, that publishes salvation that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Well, this is really interesting, because who do you suppose those people are, or that is, who publish this peace? Well, we saw before that it's Zion's watchmen. And who are they? Well, they are also the kings and queens of the Gentiles. And they are also the 144,000 servants of God in the book of Revelation, or the servants of God in the book of Isaiah. They, they go by different names according to their different tasks that they perform. But what are they publishing? Three things. Good, or good tidings. And good is a synonym of covenant and covenant blessings. Salvation, which is Jesus Christ himself, but also the idea of salvation of souls. And also peace. Peace being a synonym of good and of salvation. So we see that peace is very intimately tied with the coming of the Lord himself. 
And as we saw previously, only God, Jehovah, in the book of Isaiah, establishes peace. Only the Lord himself can do that. And that is a real peace, not the peace they're trying to establish in Jerusalem right now, political means. That'll never work, of course. Like the Arabs say, the Jews want peace. A peace of Jordan, a peace of here, and a peace from there. <laughs> well, you get the idea. Next we go to 3 Nephi 22, verses 1 through 3. And this is quoting from Isaiah 54, 1 through 3. Zion enlarges her habitations. And we read it in Isaiah itself, but we can also just read it in 3rd Nephi. Then shall that which is written, written by who? Well, Isaiah, of course, Isaiah 54, come to pass, sing, O barren, that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, said the Lord. All right, so what's going on here? Seems like there are two wives here. The one that doesn't bear is barren, and he did not travail with child. And she's going to have more children than the married wife. All right, well, who's the married wife? Well, we are. Today, we, Latter-day Saints, are the covenant people of the Lord. And as we mentioned, they fall away. They apostatize for, in large part, except a few who repent, who take the gospel to the house of Israel. In the house of Israel, the Jews, the ten lost tribes, and the Lamanites, they have been, as it were, barren, not bringing forth fruit. They've been in a lost and fallen state all these years without the gospel. And so now they're going to bear children in the millennial age beyond all previous situations. And so they're going to have more children and more fruits of the womb and, and more fruits of righteousness, period, than the children of the married wife, the current wife. Because the current wife is going to prove as rebellious and disloyal, and the Lord is going to divorce her and remarry his covenant people as the gospel turns from the Gentiles back to the house of Israel. And then he says, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. So really, eventually they're going to cover the entire earth, and that will be when Zion spreads across the globe, and eventually, at the end of the millennial age, the entire earth is translated, or becomes a celestial globe, a great Urim and Thummim, as the prophet Joe Smith indicated. All right, so hope you've enjoyed this. In summary, the Lord establishes Zion, the people of the house of Israel inherit Zion after they believe in him, or at the time they believe in him, and he gathers them to Zion, the place Zion. So they're both a Zion people, spiritually, and they also inhabit the place Zion, the people in a place. The time frame is the end time, when Zion is established among his people of the house of Israel. And moving forward, will our feet be beautiful upon the mountains and as heralds of Zion? Will our LDS feet, right, be beautiful among the nations as heralds of Zion? That's the task that is waiting, awaiting Latter-day Saints, as we discussed in previous podcasts. The whole idea, I guess, of these podcasts is to acquaint ourselves with, these, with this task, with this, this agenda that we have been given as Latter-day Saints, that when the time is right, when, when it's the Lord's time frame, we'll be ready to take it on as other prophets of the past took it on. Someone had to. They did. Were they better than us? Not necessarily. They just did it. They prayed, they asked for it, and the Lord empowered them, and they did it. All right, so next time, how can we know about secret combinations when they are secret? And we'll discuss those next podcast. Recommended reading, the book End Time Prophecy, a Judeo-Mormon Analysis. Thank you very much for listening. Share with friends, and we'll see you the next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today. Tune in next week to hear about How Can We Know About Secret Combinations When They Are Really Secret?